So we'll start by introducing ourselves. Um, you already know, I guess. I'm Peter Singer. Uh, I teach at Princeton and at the University of Melbourne. And um, interested in ethics and applied ethics in particular. And I'm Katarina Benatani. Um, I'm from Poland. I did my PhD uh, in Woodch University. And I work on ethics and mathematics and Henry Citric. And that's why we are here together today. Yes, we're, well, common interest is, is Henry Citric, who is uh, one of the classic uh, utilitarians. Um, you're probably more likely to have heard of Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill than you are of Henry Citric, but. Um, we and a number of other philosophers in the field think that actually Sidgwick is the greatest of the three in terms of um, in terms of being a philosopher who gets things right. Uh, not denying that uh, Bentham may have been more original, certainly was uh, there in the field earlier, and uh, John Stuart Mill um, wrote widely about a range of different topics, including liberty and the subjection of women and wrote fluently and well. Um, Henry Sidgwick's style is um, more solid, some people would say a little dull, but um, that's because he's very careful to qualify the things that he says, not to overstate his position, but to consider objections along the way and show how he would deal with those objections. And so that doesn't necessarily make for the most exciting reading and maybe accounts for his comparative neglect as compared to Bentham and Mill. But I think he just read too much of German philosophy. You read too much German philosophy? <laughs> That's like corrupt, it's corrupt more German style. than it's English. If you're used to English philosophy, then you know that. That is quite easy to read. Yes. Well, for whatever reason anyway. So we, we feel that he's um, unduly neglected and that he has a lot to say that's very relevant to contemporary issues in ethics and uh, so um, we decided to write a book that would develop his ideas on a lot of major themes in ethics and when uh, the opportunity to teach this course was presented I thought that the book that we're doing together was uh, a good opportunity to get to, to use some of that material to get your responses to it to try it out in various ways. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're starting off with this question about <coughs> uh, the role of reason um, in action, so practical reason. So we're starting out with a very fundamental level, um, and we will, uh, the, the title of the course that's given is um, Utilitarian Ethics for the Living. Um, we're going to get to the more applied bit of that about how do we live our lives um, and what does utilitarianism suggest in terms of how we ought to live our lives. Uh, we'll be getting to that as part of the course over the next three days, but um, we're trying to start with the more foundational questions in order to work up to that. So we're beginning with um, this question of, of reason in action, which is a controversial <coughs> question in philosophy. Um, the idea that we, we, a lot of people feel we have an understanding of what reason is, we know what it is to reason our way to conclusions, uh, but we have in mind then mostly theoretical reasoning. Reasoning to solve a problem, reasoning to discover the right answer uh, or the truth about some particular claim that has been made. Um, but in terms of reasoning in practice, we're thinking about um, what is it to have a reason to do something? And uh, that's a more controversial conception, has been throughout the history of, of philosophy, certainly the history of Western philosophy. So I thought we might start by um, actually asking you to say some things uh, about that. Um, if we throw out the question to you, what is it that makes an action rational, or conversely, what, it, what is it that makes an action not rational? Um, what are the kinds of things that come to your mind? I realise that you've done some reading on this, and so it's not completely like testing your naive views on this, but it would be interesting to know 
what kind of things come to your mind. Um, you can either do it in terms of general characterizations of what it is that makes an action <coughs> rational or not rational, or <coughs> some examples of uh, actions that might be rational, might not be rational, and then we can discuss what it is that um, distinguishes the, these categories. So anybody like to start? Yes. So perhaps if you could, sorry, at the beginning, say your name. We did get a list of, of photographs and names, but it will help us if uh, you could say your name when you speak. Hi, I'm uh, David Laraway. I uh, teach Latin American literature. Um, I would think that deliberation has some kind of role to play in whatever story we tell about rationality. Deliberation is to how to achieve a particular end. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to take some some notes. Um, uh, so deliberation about how to achieve a particular end. Yeah. Um, okay. <coughs> Anybody uh, want to either <coughs> take issue with that and say that's not it, or to go further than that and say that's enough? Okay, yeah, I think there's a certain um, degree to which you have to circumscribe the factors which you are deliberating. In other words, um, if you're going to say that, you know, you have to decide for yourself what you're going to consider in a given field of operation so as to pursue it rationally in the first place. So not all factors that are up for discussion will be eligible to it if it's going to be a rational answer. Yeah, or you have to pick the ones in order that you're going to discuss in the first place. There's a sort of decision. Okay, so an obvious question will be which one? Right. right. And you also said about deliberating on certain um, aims, right? So on the one hand we have an aim, and on the other we have a way to do this something that we want to achieve, right? So is rationality about the two things, or only about one thing, about the way to the aim? Or you can say that certain aims are rational not rational. And if so, then which one? There was somebody else yesterday. Yeah, uh, my name is Ewan McDonald. Um, I think uh, passion has a lot to do with the uh, outcome of reason. Mm -hmm. uh, just say a little bit more about that. Please. Well, I just know a little bit. I mean, I'm not uh, that well versed in all of this, but uh, I know Hume spoke before these guys about passion and reason becoming a slave of, of passion, human kind of desire and things like that. Yes, <coughs> that is correct as an account of Hume's view that he says reason is and always has to be the slave of the passions. Um, so that is one view in the debates that have been going on about reason, not the passion I mean, most people, in fact, what, what Hume starts out saying is, you know, it's very common for people to distinguish reason and passion and to say reason and passion are opposed to each other. And he's trying to take a different view and say that that's a mistake. They're not actually opposed to each other. Um, so I guess you're, you're sharing, saying with Hume, therefore, um, you can't, reason has to start from passion or something of that sort. Is that well, I don't think it's entirely a slave to passion, but I do think that um, in terms of the question of rational and irrational reason, I think um, passion, it begins with a, uh, an impulse of some kind of passion, sure. Okay, so what do you think about? Mm. Some examples may help. I think that rationality is also a kind of passion. To make sure it is, I was trying to say, Nietzsche used to talk about the factors of the, the logos, the fact of logic in this sense. So, so uh, maybe passion comes before reason, and we are reasoning just to get our wills, what we want. We don't really know what we want but we just want, it's about desire, and so we are <coughs> using reason, reasoning, uh, like as it was a tool to get our aims. But, you know, so I would 
not say that rational action comes before. I, I'm pretty much aware that uh, rational action, as Kant used to say, is related to, to, con to consciousness, to self-awareness, to, uh, to be able to justificate, so justification, to say why I'm doing this, why I'm doing that. But I think when we are talking about the aims, not about the means, you know, about, about the way to, to get it, uh, when we are talking about it, we just can do very good to, to, to justificate those aims. So, so you're saying we have the aims in the first place and reason comes along afterwards as a kind of a post hoc rationalization of, of the aims? I of would God? say that reason is like hesitating. So you, uh, it doesn't help you to decide. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help you to decide. No, you have already made some decisions and then you can use action as a ration, uh, oh sorry, reason as a tool to get those aims. The aims themselves you cannot justify. Okay, so a lot of you talk about aims. I just wonder if perhaps rationality develops from passion, but the aim, uh, the goals of rationality is to prevent uh, future passions, either the same passion or other passions. So a slightly Buddhist view, I guess. Is that a, a cultural stereotype? <laughs> sort, of, sort of gets control of our passions. I, mean, I know very little about Buddhism. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I'd say it seems like rationality is certainly directed towards uh, aims, like for example, um, maybe maybe a homeless person uh, or an alcoholic or something who <coughs> doesn't know that it's, it's you know, maybe stirring over to be uh, continually uh, producing alcohol, but um, I mean, it might tell 
come very soon, but uh, yeah, the, the aim of their immediate pleasure might be higher than their long-term welfare. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you are talking about an addictive person, but mm-hmm. let's say that my passion is about mm-hmm. food, and I really love sweets, but mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I know that it's unhealthy for me. Mm-hmm. Still, I really cannot do without some chocolate. Am I rational or not? If I know that sweets will do me better. I did uh, research on, uh, on Paul Boschers. I did research on methamphetamine use um, in uh, the southeast of the U.S. Sort of where I live. And uh, folks can be quite uh, rational in how they go about executing this addiction. You know, like, uh, although you're not born with an innate knowledge of how to produce, consume, or uh, acquire methamphetamine, you have to really manage it for as long as you can. And this is kind of where the... the the, I guess uh, the first tragedy in addiction comes up is when they begin to lose um, the ability to uh, account for for themselves uh, in, in their relationship to uh, this uh, substance. Uh, but uh, during, you know, the, at least the first uh, stage or so of, of addiction, as, as like we become habituated to it. I mean, you know, a lot of folks, particularly with methamphetamine, a lot of folks use it. Uh, because you know they work in these hourly jobs, and so if they have methamphetamine, they can work a double shift, and so they think, oh, you know, now I'm going to be making some extra money. Uh, but of course, uh, while they may for some time make some extra money, <coughs> not not too infrequently, becomes then uh, can, you know, the money then gets used to acquire more methamphetamine and start to acquire more. So you're saying that they start off behaving rationally, and at some point that shifts into being irrational. Um, then we could look at what marks the shift, if you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and um, frequently they they can you know uh, an addict will continue to think that they're behaving very rationally. Um, but you can see that they're not as an outsider. Uh, at some point, yeah. You know, it's like, well, you know, you are of course staring at this window, holding a gun, you know, waiting for the the folks who aren't there to leave. Um, um, well, well, that's a rational response to the thing that you see. It's so it's actually delusional, they're, 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 they're become a bit delusional. delusional, right. So, <laughs> so then the person just doesn't understand the facts of the situation, I guess. That's one sort of way of being irrational. But, it, but perhaps that's uh, more theoretically irrational out there, that they don't understand that they're having delusions, rather than practical rationality in action, which is given a certain set of information, what would be the rational thing to do. Um, sorry, you went here. Yes, uh, my name is Sebastian, and maybe it's a cultural cliche when I mentioned Holocaust, the film John. So, um, your point basically being, uh, or you made me think that, I think some people argue that the Holocaust in itself, once you have decided you want to destroy somebody, that there's also a rational way to go about it. So in a certain way, would it be correct to say that the Holocaust was rational in its execution? Or the, 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 the process of rationalization. Yeah, um, that, the, that the outcome being extremely immoral, of course, that is non debatable, but once you have decided you want to go down that path, the most rational way to do it will be to do it this way. Okay, that's a very good question, and it goes back to, the, to your question, right, mm-hmm. about the relation between morality and rationality. Can we be so immoral and still rational? Or maybe also as a, another argument coming a bit from the anthropological side, but anthropological. If you're faced with somebody from another culture and he does something which you find completely outlandish, but nevertheless you have the feeling in me and you try to raise that point and he looks at you and you can communicate about it, but you you must be aware of the fact that he is following a certain internal rationale which you are not aware of. So even though the entire process looks completely irrational, I cannot come with an example, but I don't know. I say this because of like beating your wife, for example. Mm-hmm. There will be something where clearly coming from another cultural background, I say like, yeah, maybe not. But he will be able to justify that rationally in his own terms. And be able to say like, A, B, C, this means the conclusion that B. So it's just a couple of points at the moment. Yeah, there's only points we're thinking about. So there are points about, um, one is you just... But as said, you came back to the question of morality and rationality, which we certainly do want to discuss. The other one is whether different cultures have their own standards or modes of rationality and where, whether, therefore, the notion of rationality is one that is culturally relative 
so that uh, there's no overarching rationality that uh, we can connect with between somebody of a sufficiently different culture, or, um, uh, or whether in fact there is some objective irrationality that uh, somebody from any culture ought to be able to see at some point. Those are, those are good questions we want to discuss as well. Uh, there's another hand up there behind you. Yes. Uh, what's your name? Um, Heidi. Heidi. Um, it seems to me that it might be helpful to narrow our definition of rationality even more, because um, so far um, we've talked about it as a process of deliberation and that um, that that sort of hesitation that we have before we make a decision and the thought that goes into that. Um, but I think that maybe we do need to connect it to morality somehow because otherwise, how do you distinguish um, uh, rationality from the passion to use this justification? How do you distinguish between rationality and justification? I guess that's my question. Uh, just say a little bit more about that. Why do you seem to assume we need to distinguish between rationality and justification? Well, because we can justify pretty much any action, but we don't say that every action is rational. I mean that you can justify it, but yeah. you say that it is not rational. Right. So the question is, are you saying you can really justify it, or are you saying people can find ways of convincing themselves that what they do is justified from their perspective, but then it would be another question as to whether they really justified it in some more objective sense. So you're saying that it's not necessarily that justification and reason have to be distinct. It's just that we have to be careful how we use the word justification and um, that's people think that's that they justify yeah. things when they may need to be not. Well, that's a possibility. But that's a basic question. I mean, if rationality is to give the reasons for action, yes. that means that you justify your action. Mm -hmm. I'm giving a reason is justifying it. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, if you do not give a reason, then you cannot justify it. Right? So there is a question whether whether the both I mean both things can be split. And obviously people can try to justify it or give a reason which is not a good reason. Um, so then it doesn't really justify it. We may say, oh they justified what they did by claiming uh, I don't know, that the devil told them to do it, or uh, something like that, but we think there is no, that's not a real justification, because there is no devil, or something like that, right? so, so, yeah, I think we need to be careful about how we're using these words, whether we're using them in a kind of success sense, where we may say, he justified what he did, meaning he successfully justified what he did, he showed that it was justified, or whether somebody justified what they did, when we mean, he attempted to justify, he said something, towards justifying it. But what he said is really crazy, so it doesn't justify it. So we do need to be careful about those distinctions. Uh, yes? Uh, Josh Fowler. Um, I think too, and I don't know quite what it's going, but rationality exists within a web of relations, uh, similar to what you were talking about. And there's an accounting of the effects that your approaches will have on other people or other things around you. And I don't know if it necessarily is tied to the aim, or if it's found more within the, the creative approach to simply living. Okay, so, so this is one option, right? Um, rationality is, you said something about it, we have an aim and then we uh, have this way out to those aims. Now, this goes to your questions about giving reasons and justifying either the way or the aim. Right? So, these are, I think, two separate things. One is to justify the aim, and one is to talk about um, the means. And you are. So, um, I'm not sure if this is what you are saying. Is it what you have in mind that there there are some relations with <coughs> other people or other creatures or other beings, and you are here, and then the actions you take towards them make things rational? Yeah, and at a certain point, you're taking account of 
starting to use this, a cost and benefit analysis almost. Yeah. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to? But it's taking into account that those relations, those constantly moving and changing relations you have with um, those around you. But are you saying, I'm not clear still, what are you saying? Are you saying that what counts as rational will depend on the views of those around you? Or is it rather that the cost and benefits will depend on those around you? I think that rationality is, uh, emerges once you begin to take account of what those effects of your actions are going right. to be. Right. Okay. okay, so you need others, right? Yeah. Or you need only yourself? Is it no, it's the relation, the, the, the relation between the, the self and, and, and others. But in some cases, I mean, I'm not sure that I understand that, because you might be out there in the desert alone, right, and you might have to make a decision about what's the rational thing to do. Um, how does that depend on others? Let's say you know, you're out in the desert alone, and I don't know, you've been bitten by a snake, and um, uh, you could try and walk to a hospital, but maybe that'll make the venom go through you and you'll die. You could sit still, you know, there's various choices you could make. Um, so, does that depend on others, or does it depend on the costs and benefits to you of either trying to get to get some help, or sitting still and hoping that the venom won't circulate? Or yeah, I don't think it necessarily depends on others, per se. It's mm -hmm. the relation, it's the in-between. It's not so other people, necessarily. It's not other people. So, in that other instance, it would be Right, a conversation so you have with yourself and, and suppose it's you know, family perhaps and those that exist. Right. In your hands. Um, yeah. um, Jamie, Jamie Allen here. Uh, I was just, a couple of these examples made me think of just the relationship between rationality and epistemics. So how do we have the knowledge that we're deciding all these things on? So if you're delusional, again, whether not the internal process seems rational depends a lot on your model of the world. Similarly, for the model of the, um, how venom runs through your blood. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm just wondering about how we account for the way that we know about the other and the world. Science being kind of an obvious example. So philosophers generally do draw a distinction between um, you know, theoretical knowledge and practical, so theoretical reason and practical reason, um, uh, so that you may have completely false beliefs about the facts of the world, mm -hmm. but your, your action could be rational given those false beliefs. So let's say that you believe that if you sit still, the venom won't circulate through your body and eventually you know, it will go away and you'll be fine. But let's say that that's false. You've been bitten by a kind of snake where the venom does circulate through your body and your only hope of survival is to get some medical help within an hour and you can walk out within an hour. So. Given your false belief, it's rational for you to sit there. You'd be so sort of crazy if you didn't sit there, if you believe that sitting there is the only way to save yourself. Mm. Um, nevertheless, from some larger point of view, what you're doing is irrational because you've got an irrational set of beliefs. So at least it's irrational if you had some opportunity to know better and you just believe some, uh, I don't know, which doctor who told you this? <laughs> You could have gone online and checked with the nature of the snake and the venom, so that would be irrational. But, but, um, but the action is rational given the beliefs uh, in that case. Yeah. Who have we heard from? You? Let's go up there. Uh, my name's Colin. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of more fundamental definition that I use, or the way I think of it, is just a matter of uh, input dimension. Output. For example, if you have um, some egg and flour. Tomato soup is an irrational output. Whereas, I don't know how to make pancakes, so maybe pancakes would be or cookies somehow. Um, and then something, even something that's rational on a scale like that, if you um, look at it in a broader view, includes a large number of inputs, even if it was there to begin with, something that was originally rational can become irrational. So the circumstances that you're in can dictate what is going to be a rational thing for you to do. Um, that's a pretty good way of putting that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you said a minute ago, oh sorry, uh, Jake. Yeah. Um, you said a minute ago um, that uh, the rationality might be dependent on the beliefs, right? Like you, if, 
for example, sitting in the desert might be rational given your knowledge, but if you had a better set of knowledge, um, there would be a different uh, rational outcome or, or action. Um, wouldn't that imply that um, at, at some level all action is irrational because we never have perfect knowledge? Mm. Mm. Well, that's a question. I mean, if you want to um, make a pancake mm -hmm. and you actually know what a pancake is, then you know that you need an egg and flour. Sure. Um, that seems quite simple, right? But if you want to know something more, like what would be the best life I want to have, then maybe this is more difficult um, to judge, right? What act I should take to reach the point, right? To reach the same. We're talking about. I think that we are still um, mingling between those things. I mean, one is the instrumental reason, and it's clear about the egg and flowers and flower. And um, the other point is about aims. So, why don't we talk about that? Right, so, about aims now. So, what are the rational aims? What do you think? Well, is there such a thing at all, right? And I think we haven't got yeah. to the point yet because a lot of people have started to say, um, right from the beginning, I think, uh, David began us with deliberations about how to achieve a particular end. Um, and that's a view very much in keeping with what David Hume says and some of the reading you have. So you're wanting to raise that question, is that right? Yeah. Whether, so, okay, so let's focus on this a little bit. Um, I think we're all clear that um, one role for reason in practice is to deliberate about an end, so that um, if you do have eggs and flour and you're hungry, then what should you do with them in order to meet your appetite and have something that you enjoy eating as well? Or if you're bitten by a snake in the desert and you want to live, what should you do? Reason can perhaps tell you what's the best way to maximise your chances of survival in that case. But but can reason tell us about other ends? And we've had some examples, I suppose. I mean, can reason tell us that um, genocide uh, is a, not a, a rational end, or that um, you know, getting rid of a, uh, a minority uh, that you don't like is not a, a, a rational? That's, that's one thing that brings back brings us back to the morality question. Um, but there's lots of other uh, mm -hmm. examples. Again, I mean, we had the, the methamphetamine example. Of, um, can can reason tell you that uh, getting addicted to drugs is an irrational thing to do, even if maybe at the time you want to do it? Or uh, let's take something else. If somebody says, that's more common in our society, if somebody says, my aim is to become as rich as possible, and I'm going to do whatever it takes you know, cautiously, so I don't get, I could become a criminal because I know I could get caught, but I'm going to do whatever it takes to get as rich as possible. Is that a rational end? Is there any criticism that you can make of that from the point of view of reason? Um, well, I don't see pretty much well how could we uh, justify a name. And by name, I mean some kind of desire, will, pleasure, I think. Let's retake the simple of sweets. Sweets are good. So I want to get some sweets from that. Uh, why are they good? I don't know. Oh, I they can't good. say why, but, but they, they're good. They're pretty good. But I can't say why are they good. They're just good. You know? So I, I can't justify uh, pleasures or things like this. Goods. Why are they good? No, you are really but saying they are good because I want them. Oh, well, maybe saying they are good because they are pleasure. Uh, a, a rational way to approach uh, those aims or those wills. Uh, we need to learn how to use our pleasures. So uh, it's not. We must to be very prudent because our pleasures can be all very damages to us. You know, so if I get you know, a lot of sweet, I would get really fat and I would die. But the, the sweets are not bad. They are pretty good. I don't know why they are. They are. And, you know, I have to establish a kind of relation with the pleasures 
that uh, may uh, yield me to, to, to keep alive. Life is good. I cannot uh, justify it, but I feel that that's good. It's nice to be alive and to be living. Uh, you know, I need reason just to, to learn how to use the pleasures. But if you say that your life is good, that really means something else than simply life is good, yes? You enjoy it, you have something in it that you enjoy properly, maybe um, there are other things that you could enumerate to say that your life is good. It's not yeah. that you cannot say anything about that, right? As about sweet, I mean sweet things in themselves are, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe neither good nor bad, but it's the way first. Uh, about my um, attitude towards them, that makes them good or bad, maybe, or maybe there is something good or bad in itself. That's the question. Next. It seems to me that if we're going to ask the question whether or not an aim is rational, um, whether or not the meet the end to which you might imply a certain kind of instrumental rationality as you mean is itself rational suggests a almost like transcendental criterion for how you would do it. So, you know um, it would require an understanding of a good aim or a bad aim a reasonable or unreasonable one um, which would and I don't know how you would decide whether or not that criterion is itself rational. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is sort of infinite regression um, until you get to some sort of primary motivation for your rationality, which, and I'm not sure whether or not, I, I, know I don't have the means by which to judge whether or not that's rational. Okay, so you're saying, let's say that here, that something is rational, and you say, to say that something is rational, you need a reason to say that it is rational, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you have another one, and then you have another one, and then another one. That's a classical example of regression, as you said, and that's really something that Aristotle said, for example. And he said, well, at the end, you cannot go back and back and back. There is the end. And the end is your nature. So what is rationally? Rational comes from your nature. Of course, this nature is viewed in a certain way. Do you know anything about about Greeks and their way of understanding reason and rationality and nature? And what it means that what is natural is reasonable. Well, it's proper, it's proper to its essence. Mm. You know. Uh, whatever that means. Um, um, I just know Plato in the Republic uh, the, the three tripartite souls uh, I believe it's the heavens and the um, spirited and um, the rational and the rational is like the chariot the driving the horses or, uh, the horses are the like is that right? That's, that's a reasonable Summary of Plato's account, yes, that's right. So, um, the rational should be in charge and um, it should come first and then make decisions. The rational okay. should, should be in charge of, right. should be in charge of the appetite, <coughs> so. And then rationality is somehow fascist. It's somehow what? Fascist. 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 Somewhat <laughs> majority of writers putting it. I don't say you I don't think Plato would say you can't have pleasures. We've just got to say reason should be in control of the pleasures in some ways. I mean I think it goes back to um was it uh Ford, was it, you know, talking about um yeah, talking about the, the drug addiction, right? So so if somebody takes a drug and it gives you a great feeling of pleasure, um and therefore you want more of it, then I guess Plato's view would be, reason is going to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there was nothing wrong with that there, just having a, trying that, but if you're going to go down that road, you have to know what lies ahead of it, and what lies ahead of it is uh, a, a, lot, a lot of misery as well. Let's just assume that that's the case, but in simple terms. So reason is a kind of a check there in, on the appetites. 
So I, I don't know that I, w I wouldn't think of that as fascist, uh, or at least to, to think of that as fascist is to, to, I guess, take the opposite view that these appetites should simply be uncontrolled and go their own way. That's kind of a, an anarchic uh, uh, view of, of the appetites need no control. I wouldn't be too happy with that one. I was just going to say that, um, sort of, in a way, I do kind of agree with what you say about it being fascist, but it can be, the reason can be oppressive to a passion. And you can have, as Paul said, this reason to, um, not exactly sure which is, but a reason to not want to do this certain, to not want to do the speed. Nothing says it. Um, but that is, that can be driven by an aim which, you know, or a desire to, or a passion to um, keep yourself well. So, reason is seems tied to passion in this sort of, you know, dance almost. It's sort of all the way back and forth. And, and um, uh, I mean, I, I think an important thing to look at is, is sort of what I was saying, is how, how reason can oppress a passion and that passion will find its way out. That passion does, it won't end the passion. And what if passion is something really awful, like I want to kill someone, right? But I really hate something. What about that? Yeah, I mean that that's a that's a problem. I mean I don't know that I don't know that rationality is the is the end all of dealing with that because that is still going to exist somewhere within that passion. I mean, I believe that it's still going to exist in that person. It doesn't kill it. All it does is it justifies the reason for, um, for not doing it. But if it's a passion, if it's a desire, um, I, my, my question is, can, can it be completely quelled? Can it be um, staunched by reason? Okay. But, but sorry, just I want to just make one comment on that. Let's suppose that psychologically you're right, but still I don't act on it. So, so for example, you know, somebody has done something bad to me, I want revenge, I think therefore of killing them. Um, but then, you know, I start to think about this, I deliberate, I reason the sorts of things we're talking about, and I say, look, firstly, if I kill them, well, you know, their family maybe is going to in this sort of culture is going to want to kill me or my family, it's just going to start this spiraling blood feud, or perhaps I'll spend the rest of my life in prison, doesn't really solve the problem. So, I therefore don't kill this person. Now it's true, let's say, what you say, psychologically, I still have this feeling of revenge. It hasn't gone away, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not acting on it. Yeah, but I mean, that's still better, isn't it, yeah, than, well, than me acting on it? In a sense, but I guess, I guess my question is, is, what do you do with that passion? You may go home and pick your dog. Or um, you know, I mean, it's it's sort of like it it still exists as a force. <coughs> okay, but yeah. it's better, right? Even even you know, me as a sort of uh, animal liberation advocate would still say it's probably better to go home and kick your dog than to go and murder your friend. Um, uh, and you know, if possible, maybe you can think about kicking the dog, and you can repress that as well. And also, you know, just and just kick a door. Kick a door, yeah, that's right. You know. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's better for you better. It's still there, but, but reason has played a role in directing the action, mm -hmm. yeah, which seems to me a positive one, and therefore I wouldn't describe it as either fascist or oppressive. Um, I'd describe it as... Uh, but couldn't you say, well, then I shouldn't pick the door because I'll ruin the door. I mean, you could you could end you up pick a really solid steel door. You, know, <laughs> you, 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 you could end up with this line of, re of reasoning to where you just totally press everything that you want to do, every, any desire you want Until could you be repressed. But that really explodes in an orchard. Right, exactly. You know, so this is the kind of theory that's like those games where you have to you know bang the things as they pop up and you bang down one and another one pops up. Yeah, equal uh -huh. force. Yeah, yeah whack a mole or whatever. <laughs> But, I mean, I don't know that we really have to accept that view. We don't have to accept that, that you know, if you've got this bad feeling, somehow it's got to come out and the consequences are going to be just as bad whichever way it comes out. That doesn't seem right to me. No, I, I was... No, no, no. That may be our character too. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I was just saying it's a question. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. David wanted to get into the discussion. I think the problem is we need more robust uh, what's entailed by rationality. I mean, 
we often um, are very poor judges uh, of the aims that we're pursuing, and even though we can use instrumental reason to help us figure out some way to get that aim and the problem we're running into, is the aim is one that shouldn't be pursued in the first place. And if I'm a poor judge uh, in, in some respects of the aims that I'm pursuing, I would stand to benefit from additional perspectives on my um, on my aims, and some of those perspectives would presumably be corrected. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we need some kind of mechanism to help us uh, deliberate in a, a relatively impartial way so that I can sift through idiosyncrasies in my own situation that may not be germane to the aim that I have defined for myself and things that really are worth pursuing. So I think we need some sort of element. I don't know if it needs to be some sort of metaphysical transcendental element, but some sort of elements or uh, mechanism that will give us uh, a degree of uh, impartiality. Okay. So that's an interesting. So that's the idea of impartiality being related to reason has emerged now too, um, which is also relevant to some of the discussions about morality. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I really, I radically disagree with the view that uh, morality is something uh, to be impartial, because they would repress desire. Uh, what we have not reoccurred is passion is always coming up in this discussion as being a good driving force. Mm -hmm. uh, we have spoken about the following units and how the units and say who would be completely destructive <coughs> and that uh, actually a destructive driving force. And I think we need to put that in the context of <coughs> self-centered passion can also be destructive, very radically destructive. Um, <coughs> And as, as you said, uh, how, how we're going to like, build up something that we're going to do some kind of transcendental order where we try to balance the Apollyon and Dionysian value. And I would also like to start moving towards putting things in linking, we use all these little micro examples in reality. You were talking about like, what do I try to eat? What am I going to make out of this dollar and the egg with the seal? We can create a link this to a macro structure. For example, um, was the dog that I bought ecological, ecological? Or was the egg that I bought how we ate these animals? So it's not that simple. We're always asking in context. We're talking about being out in the desert and the possibility to get health. That has to do with the healthcare system, which has to do with another morality. We talk about these micro examples that we are linking them up to the greater consequences of our actions. It's not as simple. It's a whole chain of events. And yeah, I would like to get into that. Okay, so the question now is can we can we find this other thing, right, that would for example justify the smaller things? Yes, that's what you yeah. what you have in mind. And I guess your question was also if passion is good, then when this is good, right? Or yes. And in which extent is true, when does it become destructive? And that passion can be... Okay. So maybe the question... So maybe the question to those who believe in passion. Huh? Do you think that all the passions are fine? All that... I brought up passion, um, and it was strictly within the understanding that passion is neither good nor bad. It was not a. It was not a. An un, it was not brought up as some kind of naive, uh, pleasurable type of a thing. And so I think that's got to be clear. And I think um, I was going to bring up another example. Maybe it's still not big enough in terms of a, a bigger, higher uh, issue of rationality. But um, uh, McNamara. I mean, I don't want to get into the Vietnam War if you don't want to. But uh, McNamara was a prime example of somebody that uh, used uh, game theory and, and very sort of scientific rational um, devices with specific aims in, in the war and of course at the end, uh, at the end of his life, one of his famous uh, lines was, rationality will not save us. And I think, um, I just wanted to throw that out there. It maybe isn't big enough for the for the all the substructures and social kind of issues that you're getting at, but um, um, 
But in terms of passion, yeah, I, I don't want that to be confused with some kind of, you know, pleasure. That's, it's not an issue there. Um, yeah, just uh, along with that, um, before when I said that, that rationality uh, perhaps develops some passion to um, control or stop future passions, I, I, I also wasn't thinking of passion uh, as a pleasurable, and so only that. Um, I certainly didn't mean this in, in like an aesthetic kind of thing. Um, I, I was thinking, I mean, perhaps um, to take the example of sweets, to go back to that example, um, I like sweets, so that's my passion. Okay, so I can rationalize that it's bad for my body, so I don't, uh, I don't eat sweets, so I control my intake of sweets, so then that would be preventing it. But if I like sweets and I think that there's nothing uh, wrong, I rationalize that there's nothing wrong with eating sweets, I think that there is still a control of a passion or a suppression of it, and that's, uh, that passion is fear, uh, that there's, this there involves that, that enjoying this pleasure may involve suppressing this fear that I have. I think fear is also a passion as well. So it's like a struggle of passion. Yes, that's what I, I, I call it. So, so let's think, I mean, I know a number of you have quoted out sort of larger moral issues, and, and we are definitely going to get to those um, over the next three days, but, but let's follow through this idea in a way that is perhaps a bit more dramatic than sweets, but, but does look at present passions and longer-term consequences. So let's take smoking. Um, so... Let's assume that this, we're talking about somebody who um, enjoys a cigarette, gets pleasure from smoking, um, but who is also well aware of the health costs of smoking. Um, you know, quite familiar with the evidence, doesn't challenge or deny the evidence. Um, so knows that by smoking heavily now, um, I'm probably shortening my life by 10 or 20 years. Um, and it probably means that I'm going to die at an early age in a, from lung cancer or something like that in a pleasant way, um, and accepts that uh, at the time he will probably regret that he smoked um, at the time when he starts to become ill and realises that he could have lived a lot longer if he hadn't smoked. But what he says now is, uh, I want to smoke now. So you have this passion, if you like, and this desire. I enjoy it, I want to smoke now, and I don't really care that much about what happens to me in 20 or 30 years down the track. Is, the, is, that, is that irrational? Is there something irrational going on here? Or is, that, or is there nothing further that practical reason can say against this? Because this person is fully informed, we don't have the problem of mistaken beliefs, but it's fully informed at least about the relevant consequences, the probabilities and so on. Something wrong? Um, Thank you. Well, it can certainly be rational from this perspective, but if you take a wider perspective, then it's irrational. Which of those two perspectives is more rational is in the judgment? So tell us a bit more about what you mean by rational from his perspective, and not if you take a wider perspective. Well, if you look at the aspects he has of his consideration within his view, and this is true for anyone in any situation, you can only act on the information that you have in front of you. But based on the information that he has, he's making a rational decision. For some well, why, sorry, why is it a rational decision? I mean, he has the information. He accepts that smoking now is probably going to shorten his life. He accepts that he'll regret that he smoked 20 years down the track, but that's very likely anyway. So, he, so why is it rational for him to continue to smoke on the basis of that information? Um, he could he could say to himself, or he could believe, or he could have rationally worked out that it's best to gain the maximum pleasure or enjoyment, or maybe cigarettes give him some sort of, um, that he feels that they make him mentally sharper. Maybe he feels it's best to take advantage of that now when he's young and has energy and is productive, rather than when he's older and he's less physically capable and mentally capable. Yeah. So that's one possibility. I mean, the way you described him now, it's almost like he's trying to say, even looking at it over the whole duration of my life, it's rational for me to smoke. 
because the next few years are the most important years of my life in some way, and I'll be more mentally alert and sharper if I smoke. So maybe I'll achieve something great. I mean, I can imagine a story that does make sense and that does make it rational in that way. Let's suppose that I'm a scientist and I need to work very hard, and if I do, I'm going to achieve some great breakthrough. Let's even say it's going to be a breakthrough in the cure of cancer. Um, not my own, you know, not my own the cancer that I like to get. Let's say it's a, it's a different kind of cancer, not related to smoking. <coughs> so he says, look, I need to do this. This is incredibly important work. Nobody else can do it. I need to be at my very sharpest. I can be at my very sharpest for the next 10 years only if I smoke. Uh, so I will make a bigger contribution to the world if I'm really sharp for 10 years and die in 20 years than if I'm less sharp for 10 years and die in 40 years. That's a view which I guess is giving, you know, looking at a broader perspective and, and giving weight to things that are making a bigger difference to the world. And I could see that as, as a rational justification of something. But suppose he's not like that. Suppose that um, there isn't anything particularly better that he can do now that it's important to be mentally sharp for than he'll be able to do at the time he's likely to get lung cancer, let's say, 20 or 30 years on. But his way of thinking rather is simply like, I want to smoke now, and I don't care about what happens to me 20 or 30 years on. Um, so is it still rational from his perspective to smoke? Or have we now got to a view where that's not a rational perspective that he's holding? I think you could <coughs> make the argument that his belief is that if he, doesn't, if he doesn't care about later, and he believes that it's, um, it makes sense not to care about later, I mean, obviously I think most of us would disagree, about, disagree on that point, but if that's what he holds, then I think it could be considered a rational, a rational decision. Okay. Um, yeah. Mike, Michael, it seems to be the, the, the as similar to that from Example of uh, uh, an example of a rational decision of the inside of the irrational context. The smoker seems to be making a, a rational choice towards his happiness of smoking at the moment within an irrational choice for his health. Okay, and you don't want to make any overall judgment about that? Um, there's nothing more to be said? Than um, well, I. I wanted to, I was, it might be interesting to link that to this practical, pra this practical, this practical theory where I'm, I might be wrong but we, we made this distinction between practical and, 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 and theoretical theory and we said that, um, we said that we, within a, within a false with a false set of beliefs, we can make a rational, a rational decision, so we can react to rationally. Sort of What's the false set of beliefs that the smoker has? That, that the smoker has? Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I was linking it to uh, the, the class discussion before we... Yeah, yeah, right. But I thought you were saying that this fits, this case fits within that um, framework. No? Well, I, mean, I wanted to make that link between the assumption that there is a I wanted to make a connection between us. the assumption that there's a link between rationality and the action. So the, the, yeah. the, the, the cut point. But we kind of put that aside and said, well, we, we can act within, within, a, within a sphere where we don't even know all the. We don't need to know that. This is going to be practical here. We might have got that wrong. Right. Well, no, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to link this to the uh, discussion about about aims and whether aims can be irrational. Um, e even if you're fully informed, I, you know, I want this example to be one where the smoker is fully informed about the consequences of his action. He doesn't get any facts wrong. Um, and, he has an and his aim, he says, my dominant aim, my dominant present aim, is to have more, more pleasure now and in the next year or two. And I don't have an aim to live beyond 40 or 50, even though I know that when I'm 40 or 50 and my doctor says, I'm sorry, you've got lung cancer and there's nothing much we can do about it, he'll then, I'll then regret 
that I smoked. But I know all that, and my aim is to get pleasure now. So I'm, I'm sort of putting this, this example in order to see whether some of you will think that even though he's acting quite rationally in the instrumental sense of achieving his aim, he's nevertheless acting irrationally in some larger sense. Okay, we've got a few hands coming up. Um, I'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he is irrational. In that sense. I would just <coughs> yeah, say, um, but on what basis can I make that judgment? Um, if he knows that the the aims of his present will conflict with the aims of who he is in the future, um, and that he's in effect choosing one or the other, um, but that it's the same person and those aims are as valid for him now as they will be in the future, you are, it's, it's not rational from the point of view of the future aims. In other words, that, that he has not made an effort to reconcile those two, which I think would be the, the higher rational decision. So um, his inability to do so makes that a irrational decision. Okay. The, the privileging of his present aims over his future one. Right, it's purely so, yes, that's what he's doing, he's giving, okay, and that makes it an irrational decision you're suggesting. Yeah. Okay, if you let me, um, I try to, to divide it into two things, right? I mean, here, reasons are given by desires, passions, as we said, our wants, and so on. So, so if I want smoke, that's my aim, then I have reason for that, and I'm acting rationally. I mean, the, the time indifference will be another question, I mean, the next question. But we can have also this perspective when reason do not depend on desire, right? We also have a name. So the question now basically is, what you believe, what would you vote? That's the first option. That's the second option. Um, because what you were uh, saying about rationality of smoking goes really in either way. Okay, let's go. Who's on the first option? Hands up. I don't. Sorry, can well, you that again? Okay, so here I want to smoke. I'm fully informed. I know what will happen to me in 30 years. But I want to smoke, and therefore I believe that knowing everything and wanting gives me reasons for smoking. So I'm rational if I continue to smoke. Yeah. No, no, no. Here, I want to smoke, but knowing that it will shorten my life, I decide that I should not do that. Yes? Um, because, for example, I want to be healthy, uh, and so on, live longer, whatever you choose. Right? So, though I desire to smoke, I don't do that. But they're the same thing. No, no, no. In one case you do smoke, and the other case you don't. Yeah, you don't smoke here. <coughs> but you do not listen to your desires here. You think that you're, you still have reasons for action not to smoke that are not based on your desires. On your present desires, I think. Yes, on your present desires. Present desires. Yes. It could be based on your knowledge of what your future desires will be, but they're not based on your present desires. I think that reasons are you and have different meanings. Oh. <laughs> of course, but we are deciding. I mean, the question was whether a person who decides to smoke and knows what will happen to him in the future is rational. Mm -hmm. Here, the person who chooses second option believes that such a smoker is not rational. Here, you believe that he is. Yeah, what is that desire is rational in a certain way if they have their aim and they're fully mm -hmm. informed and whatever choice they take, they are rational. Like, I don't see what... So, that, is, so that means you're voting for one, really, what you're saying, right? So if no, it's for both. So yeah, the question was whether the person's rational and, and they're choosing, yeah. but the choice itself, but right? Because... But you know, you as a, uh, I don't know, just, just for like, like, if you would come as an observer and see two people, yeah. and how, what could you... In what position do you have to stand to say he's rational and not? Even if both, I don't know, it's like maybe can cannot both be when they're fully informed of what they're doing? Is it a choice if they follow their aim? 
But the problem is that here and here I have the same desires, right? I want to smoke, but here I listen to my desires because I believe that my reasons are no, based no, on my desires. To, to another desire, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, desire. Yeah. <coughs> desire to be well, you feel that's healthy. Alright, that goes to what, what you said, yeah. right? That is a fight between passion yes. or between desires, as I call them. Yeah. But, but remember, the way I specify the example, I don't care about my 50-year-old self. Right? Here I am, I'm 25, and I'm enjoying smoking. I just don't care about what happens to my 50-year-old self. It's as if he's a complete stranger to me. So when you say it's, one, it's a choice of one passion or another, there's a sense in which that's true, but, but it's not the passions of the agent making the decision. The passions of the agent making the decision are all to smoke now. So... Um, it's not that passions or desires are not relevant, but in what Pellegrino has labelled too, um, it's not the present, the presently felt passions are not determining what's rational for me to do. It's the knowledge that there will be these passions in the future that are playing this role. But it gives you a present equilibrium. It may do so. Isn't it really just a matter of time preference then? Mm -hmm. Yes, well that's right, but it's when, I suppose it, one way of putting this question that we're trying to pose is whether it is irrational to have a strong bias for the present, or the present or the immediate. Uh, actually, you cannot, you cannot have knowledge of your future passions or desires, you can, you can only predict. Yeah. And, well, I'm not a smoker, but I could be a smoker and I could predict that uh, when I'm 60, I'll be glad that I uh, I was a smoker because that was uh, I don't know the more, more so much. yeah or whatever <laughs> that was the uh, more exciting way to live my life and uh, I'm going to die anyway at some point so <laughs> well, well it's possible but you know I could, we could take you around just to make sure you're well informed we could take you around the, the wards of patients with lung cancer and we could. Ask them, you know, what do they think about the fact that they smoked when they were younger? And you know, 95% of them say, "I wish I'd never smoked." And, you know. But my mom always said that I'm, I'm special, so I'm perhaps a five percent. The thing is, the, the desire exists in the present in both of them. I mean, the desire to not smoke exists in the present. The desire to smoke exists in the present. That's, that's the, really the only desire, right, that we're talking about? Why is it you're, you're talking about the result or the aim in the long run, but that the desire is an immediate one, whether I want to smoke or not smoke, based on whatever information I have and, and yeah. however I might rationalize. But it's all based in, I mean, it's all happening in the present. Let's, is, sorry. let's keep the example with smoking, but rather take the example with, with killing someone, okay? The desire to do harm to someone. So here, I really, maybe not you, okay? I want to harm someone, right? And this is my strong desire. So I act on this desire. Here, I strongly desire to harm someone, but when I'm thinking about this, when I'm deliberating, I know that this is not a rational thing to do. That I do not have a reason to harm the person. Right? That's a great difference, isn't it? And here, I mean, now we should decide which action is rational. Are they both rational or only one way is rational? If I don't do it, I'm more afraid of what can happen to me after the you mean afraid of being punished for yeah. harming the other person? We're going to assume that you'll get away with it. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's no, there's nobody's going to be able to pin it on you. You, you, you know how to harm this person. Let, let's say you're, I don't know, you're going to damage their car. They, they park their car outside. It's a dark night. You can, they love their car. You know, it's a very fancy car. You can easily walk past it and make horrible scratches in the new coat that will cost thousands of dollars to repair, nobody will see you do it. Hmm? I'm just sort of saying, you, 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 I, I'm, I'm just trying to change the example so you don't have to worry that right. you're going to get caught or punished for it or anything like that. Isn't it that sometimes you desire 
design something and you think, okay, I won't do that. It's stupid. Of course, putting fire. Number two, so clearly why? the better option. Yeah. Of so course. why do you do that? Why do you not always listen to your desires, to your passions? Because you can foresee potential uh, consequences of. Uh, well, on the left, you've got the birth of tragedy, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. When you think, when you know, you think you can be a god, or you can 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 get away with it, <coughs> or whatever. But of course, on the right is where your personal uh, ethics and morality yeah. and its consequences. Can you just make it? I think you're. Yeah. I'm thinking of now we have enough to turn, which is not to be confused with morality. Deterrence is still something that I have to my own sake, my own way, and feel for the being. I believe the first, the first example, um, I think that people are confused to want what I want to do, my will to do, with reason. In the example of the smoker, this person is deliberating over his or her present experience. But it's not reasonable. It, 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 there's no reason in that deliberation. I mean, it's, it's not. It's not. It's just I, my want, my desire uh, overrides all reasonable arguments, and therefore it's unreasonable. It, it is not. A, it's not moral. And deterrence in itself is not moral either. It is, I do, I do not do this because I'm afraid. It has nothing to do with morality. So the second one has nothing to do with mm -hmm. morality either? Um, even in no, I think the second one has to do with uh -huh. morality. Mm -hmm. The second one, you have, you, you enter a moral and a reasonable and logical room and integrate that in your actions. The first one doesn't. And that I think this goes back to um, the point I made earlier about, or that you discussed um, in answers about justification versus um, reason. Um, some justifications are in, in accordance with reason and others are not. And I think in this case, um, the passions, in the case of the smoking um, and the choice to smoke, with full knowledge, I think that the case where passions are entering in and decisions are being made on, based on the passions and um, the choices being justified um, rather than um, justified poorly rather than justified well according to um, And I think that in order to determine that that is a poor choice, it really has to go back to some greater consumption of what it what it means to live a good life, and so then that goes back to the connection with morality. Yeah. Okay, uh, and we'll have a few more hands. Should we get around the room? Yeah. 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 But do, do, you, uh, do you normally take a break? I mean, are we going to help you guys? At 11.30. At 11.30, alright. So let's go around the room, get some hands quickly, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll say something about it. So let's just go around and disorder more or less. Yeah? Um, two things are bothering me. So, um, death and guilt. And what is it, is it rational for us to be afraid of death? and to mark our actions in relation to that fear of death. Um, given everything that we know about life, it ends, it begins, it ends, it begins. Everything around us does the same thing. Wolf King. <laughs> yeah. um, is it rational to live our lives in accordance with the fear of death? And I think that goes to the smoking example, but it goes to a lot of other examples as well. I'm also interested in how often guilt is used in these types of conversations. Um, and so maybe that would touch on the morality aspect that we'll talk about after the break. But we will just be interested in talking a little more about that. Yeah. Okay, okay. who's the next one around? Who's going around? Maybe in terms of what you were saying, also um, identifying um, truth to, to your past or truth to what your understanding of your own past is. Um, <coughs> I would say fire 
IRA. Um, and my mother is Catholic from Northern Ireland. I, I would find myself identifying as IRA. I, I know it's ridiculous, but, but I have that, um, you know, circumscription of my own self, you know, um, which, which, you know, do I choose to step outside of, of that? I'm not going to kill, but you can just that feel the same for me. You know, I, I feel guilt, but, you know, I feel that also destabilization, and it's because of this sense of nature and, and truth to past. So it's the opposite of, of death and, and future, but I think it's the same thing. Okay, we're going to have this one. Some more hands there. Yes, I'm standing uh, just the. I, I really enjoyed the argument of the um, in the future, basically, that I will regret in the future in a sense of the form of like identity tyranny, that I'm depriving myself in the future of choices. But nevertheless, I smoke now being rational, but because I deprive myself of future choices, can be immoral, but now what can be rational and immoral, or vice versa. Moral and irrational. Something I'd like to discuss. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, a small one. It's um, not related to that in, in terms of temporal process, and whether or not a few people that have brought up this idea, whether or not you can have something irrational um, in and of itself as a kind of, sort of frozen object or something. And I'm just interested in this idea of rationality as a, as a process. So, how how um, it never evolves except for in time. So things like we've talked about therapy, Buddhism, like these processes of, the, of whether or not you've thought about it being the, the thing that makes it rational or not. Whether or not you've taken the time to reflect. Uh, yeah, I'm Yeah, I have two comments. I think, um, again, to bring it back to the question of time preference, um, you know, again, who's to say that um, maybe on the right, if, it, if the right represents a bit more of a future time preference than in the case of smoking, um, can we really say that there's not beneath the time preference a desire that is present now uh, for that future time preference, which would, in a way, reduce it to desire again? Um, and then the second question I had was, uh, you know, to, like we, we mentioned before, uh, the idea of repression, and we said we don't necessarily need to, uh, agree with the idea of you know that that something repressed returns later. Um, but uh, I, I think it's almost unavoidable to bring in psychoanalysis or psych like psychology. Um, like for example, with uh, like the, the idea of the Lacanian big other. Uh, perhaps I I don't um, I don't smoke because my parents and my school <coughs> and, you know growing up oh smoking is bad and you shouldn't do it and uh, you know, maybe I'm I'm too worried about the idea of the uh, <coughs> the uh, you know like when I read the Surgeon General warning on it, it's, oh no, that the the government is you know, sort of the big other, um, and uh, you know I, I think that that has to factor in somehow. Like the the way I relate to those things can't be ignored in saying whether something is rational or not. Yeah, just on that, I, I think maybe it's a good point to, to say that um, there is a difference between explanation and justification. So, um, the reason why I don't smoke, um, you, can, you can explain that, and you can explain it in terms of, if you like, um, something like, well, you know, my parents were very dominant over my views, and... Uh, they didn't smoke and they uh, insisted on taking a long-term time preference view. And that's the explanation of why I don't smoke. And that's perfectly possible. But if I'm trying to make this decision for myself, should I smoke, should I not smoke, um, I'm not going to say, well, I don't smoke because my parents had such an influence over me. I mean, I have to really try and think of the reasons. Should I smoke or should I not smoke? Um, and that's more what we're trying to do in this and, and, and the other classes. We're, we're, we're not so much trying to be inter interested in explaining uh, from outside, as an anthropologist or a psychologist might, why some people smoke and some don't. We're rather interested in beginning with a question, what ought I to do? Um, and from that, we need to get reasons, well, this is what we're trying to to work towards, I guess, or we're asking the possibility of getting reasons that can justify one decision 
rather than another. Okay, so, so from that perspective, I think we can acknowledge the possible truth of various explanations that might, in a statistical sense, explain why, or, or go part of the way to explaining why some people smoke and some don't. But it's different from when we're trying to reach a decision in a first person perspective. Yes. Um, I wonder if there is a hierarchy of rationality where we privilege a certain rationality or a certain line of thought um, depending on time. Um, in this example of smoking, um, I would privilege, I guess, the, the second option uh, because I will live longer. Uh, rather than just follow my immediate desire. But if I take it one step further and say, well, if my rationality is, um, I'm going to die anyway, right? And death is the infinite. And, well, you know, whether I live uh, 10 more years or whether I live uh, 30 more years, um, it's not such a big difference. Not that this is my rationality, but let's say this is what's going on in mine, and, and death is that infinite, what, what difference? does this really make, then the first one would be the more, would be the privileged uh, rationality in that, in that sense. Yes, and, and that's why I really did not want to talk about timing difference here, but about desires. On the other hand, I may not have a desire to live at all and still decide that the rational thing to do is to go on living. Right? So I simply don't take desires under account. I believe, as well, people may believe, that although I don't want to live, I still should live. Because I have a reason for that. And that, of course, is a reason completely independent of, of my desires. But this is also possible. And, and this thing was about more or less this. That's why I changed into an example of not harming someone. Because desi desires here are really not important. I can't help you to, to picture the examples you are using as from this, this homo economicus, this what neoliberal economic theory always proposes, that we are kind of machines who have clear ideas of what we want and we know all the perfect parameters and we can make a rational economic choice. But th this is how I kind of picture the examples you're using. But I don't know, we spent the last days philosophizing about emotional cripples and people dominated by desires which are unknown to them, so it kind of sounds really opposed to that. I don't know if you could maybe say a bit more about how you picture your, the people in your example. Okay. Right, well, let me just say a couple of things about that. Firstly, um, yes, I think what we're trying to do in these sites, I, I don't know a lot about what you've been doing up to now, but um, I know you had uh, Zizek just uh, recently, and I'm familiar with Zizek and, and his work, and I know you had Simon Critchley, and uh, uh, so I think we are doing something that is significantly different from that, and that was partly my comment to uh, Jake, I think it was, about um, the difference between explaining things in psychological terms um, and trying to look at them from, the, in the first person sense, as an agent trying to make a decision, um, is important, I think, to, to grasp what we're trying to do here in, in sorting out reasons. Um, secondly, the point you made about homo economicus, I think, is is one that is definitely relevant. We started out um, among the readings with uh, Hume's theory of, of reasons in action, and that was sort of brought up at the beginning, the idea that reason comes from deliberating how best to meet your ends or desires. And that definitely became the standard economic model of um, how people behave. Uh, and there are various reasons why why it did, I think if you look at the history of economics, um, I mean, economics really grew out of utilitarian philosophy. So we had the people we mentioned at the beginning, people like, like Bentham, who talked about utility. And by utility, Bentham clearly meant pleasure and pain, pleasure positive and pain as, as the negative. And that seemed to be true uh, in John Stuart Mill, although Mill never as clear as the others. And it was certainly true in Henry Sidgwick um, that he meant pleasure and pain. And then, um, at some point in the end of the 19th and early 20th century, <coughs> there was a bit of a shift, I think partly because there was pressure on economists to turn themselves into a proper science. 
And you couldn't observe pleasure and pain. It didn't seem to be a, something that was open to scientific investigation. Um, on the other hand, you could observe behaviour. So you could uh, say to people, OK, here you are, you've got a dollar, you can buy three oranges or two apples, what do you buy? You can observe that they buy three apples, so you can see that at that particular price they prefer an, uh, whatever it is, an orange for, for this rather than that. So you observe their, their behaviour, and then the, develop, then the notion developed was that this is a sign of their preferences or their desires, and what they're trying to do is to act rationally to satisfy their desires to the best possible degree, given the resources that they have. So that was the model of economics that, um, that seemed to be more scientific and basically dominated economics until quite recently and probably largely still does, although even from within economics um, it's been challenged a lot by people like my Princeton colleague Daniel Kahneman who received the Nobel Prize for Economics a few years back, although he was actually a psychologist and he was really saying that people don't rationally maximise their desire satisfaction, that that's just fallacious in terms of uh, what we observe and how people make choices. So, um, yeah, we have been trying to, uh, to see whether, to what extent you think that that model, which you could call the homo economicus model, or you could call Hume's theory of reason, um, whether that's something that stands up and, and is, it certainly stands up to a degree. Nobody challenges that a lot of action is action to try to satisfy your desires. A lot of the role of reason in action is instrumental. But is it enough? Is it comprehensive? Is it adequate? And we've been looking at these examples now to try to push that a little bit, whether you push it in terms of saying whatever your desires are, if you don't have some concern for the future, maybe you're not rational, or whatever your desires are now are, as Karajina's example was, if you don't have some concern for others, you're not rational. So we've, we've reached the point of making maybe making that explicit and um, Perhaps that's a good point since we're more or less at half past 11 to, to take a break and we'll come back to try and discuss that a little bit more thoroughly in the second half of the class.